less than uh, a minute or a minute and a half uh, at entry at it. messages and we did not copy your last on the 1st of february 2003 space shuttle columbia fell from the sky it was nasa's worst disaster for 17 years 911 should flight sts107 have launched at all can the origins of this disaster be traced to the shuttle's original design? Is the space shuttle a human time bomb? We believe that it was a space shuttle. This is the story of how political decisions and design compromises may have cost the lives of 14 astronauts over two disasters. When the shuttle was designed, it had to cover a whole wide range of missions. When you do that, you don't ever do any one of them well. Today's shuttle system is outmoded and costly. It is also potentially lethal. And it's very clear to me we're going to lose other shuttles if things are continue as they've been going. When flight STS-107 launched seven astronauts into space, few would have believed that they would never return. My name is Scott Altman. I was the mission commander of Columbia's previous mission and I'm now part of the NASA team investigating the mishap. The tape that follows is flight deck audio and video that was recorded by the crew of Columbia as they prepared for their planned landing at the Kennedy Space Center. Okay, well. The tape begins at approximately 7.35 a.m. Central Time, 17 minutes after the shuttle's deorbit burn completed. Okay, I am going to have to do this The tape shows the crew is going through nominal entry preparations. So we have 10 minutes to get gloves on. Donning their gloves, fluid loading, and checking suit pressure integrity. Just check your suit. Okay. The tape ends with the shuttle five minutes from crossing the coast of California, four minutes prior to the first failure being observed on the ground, and 10 minutes before the first failure message was enunciated to the crew. This is amazing. It's really getting uh, really bright out there. Yep. Yeah, you definitely don't want to be outside now. Yeah, like we did before. <laughs> Less than five minutes later, to observers in California, it was clear that something had gone tragically wrong. Oh, how you describe it, Chris? Look at the chunks coming off of it. Yeah. What the heck is that? I don't know, but I see what you're saying. Space Shuttle Columbia disintegrated into thousands of pieces as it fell to Earth, killing all seven crew. You can bet that no matter what the cause was, we're, we're going to leave no stone unturned throughout the shuttle system in our quest to uh, return to flight, return to flight safely. GC flight. Was this a freak accident? GC flight. Fly GC. Lock the doors. Copy. Or a disaster waiting to happen? We go beyond the technical failings of flight STS-107 and uncover the truth about compromises made in the shuttle design over three decades ago. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. In the early 80s, the space shuttle system was widely hailed as the ultimate access to space. Start. Two, one, zero. Engines are now at 100% of rated power. In fact, its design is flawed. 
and that may have led to two disasters. It's an awkward muddle of civilian and military requirements, further confused by politicians and budgets. And we have an abort. We have a cutoff. Our Zealous abort flag is on. It's a compromise that dates back to the height of the Cold War. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. In the 1960s, America won the space race by getting to the moon before the Soviet Union. But it wasn't cheap. With every flight, NASA had to build a giant disposable Saturn V rocket. Hundreds of millions of dollars of equipment were thrown away every time a mission was launched. NASA's dream was to build a reusable launch vehicle, which would make spaceflight cheap and commonplace. You can trace the beginning, the origins of the space shuttle, really at least until the 1950s, when Werner von Braun had this idea of a giant winged spacecraft that you could reuse. You could fly it up in orbit, bring it back down, uh, clean it up, check the tires, and, and launch it again. Uh, but turning that vision into reality was not easy. NASA's original plan was for a small, lightweight vehicle that would be flown into space on top of a fully reusable piloted aircraft. The shuttle would peel off into orbit as the winged fuel tank flew back down to Earth. NASA wanted to build the ultimate dream space vehicle. But this is what they got, a jumble of fuel tanks and rockets with an aeroplane stuck on the side. When NASA uh, achieved the moon landing, there were a lot of people within the agency who thought they were going to continue to get a lot of money to do great things. The reality was that nobody in the political circles wanted to pay for this stuff. is designed to carry the astronauts in the aeroplane-like orbiter. To escape the Earth's gravity, the orbit has to carry over half a million gallons of fuel in an enormous external tank. The astronauts are only a few feet away from a reservoir of explosive rocket fuel. Even though it's burning one and a half tons of hydrogen and oxygen every second, the orbiter is still too heavy to blast off from the ground. For extra lift, two powerful rockets are strapped to the side, the solid rocket boosters. Like a firework, once you've lit the blue touch paper, there's no way to turn them off. Liftoff is the most dangerous time to be on a rocket. With so much explosive energy around, things can go violently wrong. This vehicle takes off on seven million pounds of thrust. Uh, that, that's functionally equivalent, rough, you know, in, in round numbers, to between 45 and 55 Boeing 747s stacked end to end with their engines running at full throttle. From the first moment NASA launched humans into orbit, the need for an escape route at liftoff was recognized as a top priority. The early Gemini capsules of the 1960s were fitted with ejector seats, a tried and trusted method of escaping from a stricken vehicle. So when Columbia blasted spacewards on the very first shuttle mission in 1981, NASA continued the tradition of safety first. The two-man crew had the benefit of ejector seats built into the cockpit. T minus 10, 9, 8, 
seven, six, five, four. We've gone for main engine start. America's first space shuttle. And the shuttle has cleared the tower. Luckily, they were never needed and never used. But by the fifth shuttle launch, ejector seats were removed for good. For the first time in American space history, crews were being blasted into space with no way of escaping from a launch emergency. Once you get to a crew of seven, as, as NASA has been flying, there are people down on the mid-deck, not just on the flight deck. And so the amount of the vehicle that would have to be ejected is quite significant. And uh, a retrofit of an ejection system into the space shuttle uh, would be a very costly and difficult technical undertaking. The shuttle vehicle is not well designed to provide high degrees of safety for crews. You could take advantage of the shuttle rocket propulsion system and redesign a modular type of vehicle that could, could carry humans in a, a separate compartment. And those humans could be then carried away from the main uh, propulsion system if, for example, you had some kind of accident. In fact, it's not a new idea. NASA had installed escape systems before on the Mercury and Apollo missions. But proof that they work is thanks to the Russians. Cosmonauts Titov and Strekolov were flung clear from an exploding rocket by their Soyuz capsule in 1983. And it has cleared the tower. Roger, Challenger. With no secure way of protecting their astronauts, it would be another three years before NASA would first realize the human cost of the shuttle's imperfect design. When NASA first proposed their plans for a space shuttle, they were going to need money to get it off the ground. But this was the era of Richard Nixon at the height of the Cold War. Nixon appeared to be a space cadet, but this was largely to let the fame of the astronauts rub off on him. Neil, Buzz and Mike, I have the privilege of uh, speaking for so many and welcoming you back. There's a popular myth that presidents can be space buffs, that they, they love this stuff, they think it's really neat and, and, uh, and they want to fund it. And the reality is that, uh, that you would be very hard pressed to find a president in American history who was really a space buff. They support this endeavor because it serves a political need, not because they think it's all that great. After they left the moon for the last time, NASA were keen to push on with the next phase of space exploration. But Nixon and his officials were more concerned with mushrooming spending budgets. The problem was that NASA wanted to build a fully reusable vehicle, but this plan was way too expensive, and there was no way that the, uh, the White House was going to agree to fund this. The only way NASA would get their shuttle was if they cooperated with the Department of Defense. When the shuttle was first being conceived as the national program in the early 1970s, NASA went out to every possible user, including the DOD, asking them what kinds of payloads and missions would you like a shuttle, quote, a shuttle to do. Now there's also another community that you have to think about, and that's the intelligence community, the people who build the spy satellites. The CIA and the Air Force pushed for a large payload capacity big enough to house their 60-foot spy satellites. But a large payload bay meant a heavy vehicle, and a heavy vehicle requires more power and fuel for liftoff. What the shuttle is, is a large, quite heavy aerospace vehicle that has to be launched into space, and a small fraction of the total payload of what's launched into space actually gets used in space. A vehicle of this type is inherently inefficient. You can't carry most of the weight into orbit and then bring it back down to Earth. There are ways of approaching launching things into space that would allow you to get much more payload to orbit with the same propulsive system. This decision was made for 
social and political reasons of some kind that are beyond my knowledge. Nasser was also under pressure from Nixon's Office of Management and Budget. This began a decreasing spiral of short-sighted cost-cutting measures. One proposal suggested doing away with the reusable launch vehicle. Instead, the system would use a disposable liquid fuel tank and two solid rocket boosters. Initially, NASA dismissed the idea out of hand. It might be cheaper in the first instance, but it would add to the cost of each successive flight. But when the Office of Management and Budget heard of this design, they insisted NASA accept it. Still skeptical, NASA researched the failure rate of solid fuel rockets and identified one potential weakness. Hot gas burning through the rubber O-ring seals at the joins between segments of the solid rocket boosters. Their fix was to use two sets of O-rings for safety. But still, it wasn't enough. On a frosty January day in 1986, as Challenger was about to launch, the O-rings were frozen stiff with the cold. NASA's concerns were about to be tested the hard way. Minutes after liftoff, at 48,000 feet, hot gases leaking from the faulty seal burnt through the connecting struts. In an instant, the fuel tank exploded. With Challenger, the flawed design of the space shuttle system had claimed its first seven victims. NASA's worst fears had come true. My controller is here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. The uh, NASA internal estimates for the solid rocket motors, which is what failed in the in the Challenger uh, situation, uh, was apparently one in 100,000 launches you would have a problem. That's absurd. I mean, there, there's nothing in the experience we have with these kinds of rocket motors that would lead one to believe it's anything close to that reliable. And with no means of escape, the Challenger crew was trapped inside their cockpit. The whole nose of the, of the shuttle, of the Challenger, flew further up on its, on its arc and then came back down. During that two minutes of the rest of the flight, the crew was still inside, sitting in their seats. They activated their personal air packs, but they did not have pressure suits. They did not have parachutes. Had the Challenger crew had pressure suits and parachutes, they had plenty of time to actually blow the hatches, the overhead, overhead window and the side hatch, and climb out and come down by parachute. Since the Challenger disaster, Every shuttle astronaut flies equipped with a pressure suit and a parachute so they can bail out in an emergency. NASA's problems with the shuttle continued in May 1995. The launch of Discovery had to be abandoned when woodpeckers pecked 200 holes into the foam coating on the fuel tank. To scare them off, NASA employed a foghorn and six life-size owls bought from the local Walmart. The entire system on launch consists of two solid rocket boosters, a large tank filled with liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. In order to keep that cool, especially in Florida, they need to put on a coating of insulation, a couple inches thick. Uh, on liftoff, there is a lot of vibration and it's a rapid acceleration. And what happens is some of that insulation may in fact break away from the external tank and fall and hit the bottom of the orbiter. 
talk of the space shuttle Atlantis building the station and our future in space. When Atlantis launched in October 2002, eyewitnesses reported insulating foam falling from the fuel tank during liftoff. One minute, 20 seconds into the flight. It severely dented the skirt of one of the solid Atlantis rocket boosters. And a half miles downrange, 17 miles in altitude, traveling 2,800 miles per hour. But NASA saw the foam as no danger, and there was no real attempt to stop it happening again. Booster officer reports a good solid rocket booster separation. Atlantis is on board computers, commanding the engine officer station. So when Columbia launched in January 2003, and debris again fell from the tank, there seemed little cause for concern. NASA engineers examined footage of the falling debris hours later. The debris that came off the tank in Columbia's launch and hit the wing, several pieces of it hit the wing, was noticed at launch, and yet the people at NASA who looked at it in more detail said that they didn't think it was heavy enough or fast enough to cause damage to the part of the wing it hit. The exact reason why Columbia disintegrated is still a mystery, but damage to the wing during launch remains at the heart of the investigation. Crucially, the original shuttle design would have avoided this problem altogether. The orbiter would have had much smaller wings and sat in front of any falling debris. Once in space, the orbiter is comparatively safe, traveling around the world 10 times faster than a rifle bullet. Orbiting the Earth is a lot safer than takeoff or landing, but it has its own inherent dangers. Space is littered with debris, traveling at speeds of over 15,000 miles per hour. Shards of metal from malfunctioning satellites, dislodged shuttle tiles, even an astronaut's glove have all been lost in space. This graphic is NASA's representation of the 8,000 pieces of space junk, larger than four inches across, that pose a threat in orbit. But these are just the ones that radar can see. There may be millions more. The bigger ones, the ones that are really dangerous, are tracked on space radars, and future conjunctions or, or near intercepts are, are warned about so that the shuttle actually maneuvers out of the way to dodge some of the bigger pieces and does it several times a year. They actually fly the shuttle in, in a way to minimize the impact. They fly it back and forward uh, in orbit so that the, most of the intercepts with other debris will be at this end. So, as Columbia orbited the Earth, could a tiny piece of space debris have caused the damage that later led to such a catastrophic failure? Whether or not something else did happen to hit the left wing, coincidentally, near the spot where we know the debris from the tank hit the wing, it's possible. Coincidences do occur. In fact, shuttles have been hit by space debris on every previous mission as this footage shows. Even a fleck of paint can cause serious damage. But one thing is clear. The videotape recovered from the wreckage of mission STS-107 shows a crew calmly preparing for a normal descent. They appear completely unaware that the orbiter may have been fatally damaged, unable to shield them from the searing heat of re-entry. Since the early Mercury flights, re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere has always been fraught with danger. The angle of attack is critical, too shallow and the spacecraft can bounce back into space. Too steep 
and the capsule can burn up as it punches through the upper atmosphere at speeds of 18,000 miles per hour. For those few minutes, the lives of the crew depend on the heat shield. The flames of reentry is, is, is a real classic image in spaceflight. The ship hits the air and builds up a compression shock wave in front of it, like a snowplow, a pile of snow as it goes down the street. As the air squeezes, it gets hot. And what you've got to do is balance yourself over the shock wave without having this hot air getting cl too close to you or soaking into your spacecraft. In the old days, you could use a, a heat shield that would slowly burn off, and at the end of it, you'd have a few inches left and be safe. With the shuttle, they had to have a heat shield that would be reusable with minimal repair for many, many missions. It was a totally new requirement for a spacecraft. NASA's ideal spacecraft was a small orbiter with stubby wings, similar to the X-15 rocket plane of the 1960s. These initial NASA designs with the stubby wings were within the NASA experience of flying those kinds of vehicles. They wanted to stay within what they knew how to do. The X-15 touched the edge of space. It flew above the height at which Columbia was destroyed. It suffered a short, sudden burst of heating on re-entry, but the heat quickly dissipated into the atmosphere as the space plane slowed down to subsonic speeds. But starved of funds by Nixon's administration, NASA had to share its dreams with the military, who had their own ideas. The Air Force wanted two big things out of NASA. One, they wanted a large payload bay because the Air Force was launching uh, very large uh, reconnaissance satellites, and they wanted these things to be able to fit in the space shuttle. And the other thing they wanted was what was called a high cross-range capability, which is the ability of uh, the shuttle to glide uh, a, uh, a fair distance beyond its initial ground track. And that required a large wing. And after the Air Force uh, came on board, the space shuttle got a lot bigger. It, it had this very long, very wide payload bay, and it had this cranked delta wing uh, to enable it to, to glide for long distances. The military may have got their delta wing dream machine, but this presented NASA with a new challenge. The old-style capsules only had to withstand the inferno of re-entry for four minutes. But the shuttle, with its delta wings, has to glide back to Earth at a much slower, shallower angle. It takes longer to re-enter. Its hot period lasts more than 12 minutes. The underside area exposed to re-entry is far greater than their original smaller space plane. NASA was faced with developing a totally new heat shield, something both light and reusable. They opted for a jigsaw of ceramic tiles. Now, what the tile does, and it does it extremely well, is keep heat away from the orbiter. Uh, so if I was to hold this tile in my hand and take a blowtorch and heat this tile up, within seconds I could pick up the tile from the other side. So it dissipates heat extremely well. Until you've picked one up, you don't realize how soft and, and how light the tile actually is. Uh, these tiles are made with silica, which is the basic component of sand, but it comes out sort of like crunchy styrofoam. And if you take your finger, you know, you can easily gouge the tile with your fingernail. It's not an armor plating, and it will not keep debris, if it hits it, will in fact damage the tile. Right from the inception, the tiles were the shuttle's greatest weakness. On a typical mission, uh, debris will bang into the orbiter and do uh, damage of about an inch or so greater. About 30 of those tiles will be damaged per mission. Another 50, 60, up to 100 will have little dings and dents taken out of them. In some particularly bad flights, they've had up to seven, 800 tiles that are damaged.
When they first installed uh, the tiles, about 27,000 on the bottom of the Columbia, uh, before they even rolled it out of the hangar, uh, over 10,000 fell off because of the, they hadn't glued them on correctly. So they've had this history where the tile system was uh, more difficult to, to understand than they really had thought it was going to be. We've gone for main engine start. With the tiles replaced, NASA blasted the first shuttle Columbia into space in 1981. Roger roll. Roll program complete. Roger roll complete. But in orbit, the crew reported the loss of more tiles. Okay, we, uh, we want to show you our own spot here. We do have a, uh, a few tiles missing off, uh, off of the uh, starboard pod. Luckily, they weren't in a crucial area. But the loss of any tiles exposes the airframe to the dangerous hot gases of re-entry. The structural framework of the shuttle is made out of aluminium. It melts at, well, let's see, 1,000 Fahrenheit, 500 odd degrees Celsius. Obviously, if, if you don't protect that, that aluminium, you, you're not going to make it back through the atmosphere. So we're totally dependent on these ceramic tiles to protect us. Almost certainly we could lose a tile anywhere, probably, and still survive. Could we lose two tiles? Yeah, three tiles. Well, there are certain parts of the bottom of the shuttle which are more critical than other parts. So people have spent a tremendous amount of time calculating, you know, how many tiles could you, you, you lose at different parts of the shuttle and still survive. I did a study uh, almost 14 years ago. What we found was that the areas around the landing gear doors are the ones that are very, very critical and should be watched very carefully. Debris is likely to hit there. Uh, it gets very hot on re-entry. And uh, they are protecting uh, hydraulic lines, uh, electronic sensors. Uh, there are some fuel tanks nearby. The landing gears are there, for instance. So there are some very critical and vulnerable uh, uh, subsystems located right beneath those tiles. On the 16th of January, 2003, the crew, under the command of Rick Husband on the right, prepared to launch on Columbia's 28th mission. For four of the astronauts, this would be their first flight into space. We have booster ignition and liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia. As Columbia blasted into Roger orbit, Roll. NASA's cameras tracked the launch. Main engines beginning to throttle back in a three-step fashion to 72% of rated performance, reducing the stress on the shuttle as it breaks through the sound barrier. They recorded foam insulation hitting the leading edge of the left wing, directly into the danger zone revealed in Paul Fishbeck's report. His study exposed that in 27 previous launches, falling debris had caused damage to thousands of tiles. Historically, these chunks have been relatively small. In this particular case, they saw a rather large chunk come off, about the size of a regular briefcase weighing up to about three pounds. So that was the, one of the biggest chunks I've ever seen come off. Now in orbit, at 170 miles above the Earth, the crew worked in shifts, carrying out scientific experiments in the weightless environment of space. After 17 days, they prepared Columbia for re-entry. Columbia Houston for Rick will take another item 27, please. Okay, no rush. Yep, plenty of time. On the 1st of February at 7.50 a.m., the orbiter punched through the upper atmosphere, traveling 25 times faster than the speed of sound. The plasma shockwave began heating the underside of the orbiter. We have known for a long time that re-entry is problematic, that there are many issues that need to be exactly right if you're going to survive re-entry. And it was known for, it has been known for a long time that there has been the potential for breach of the heat shield in this large vehicle. And yet, again, very little was done even when there was substantial reason to believe there might be a problem. Some plasma. 
plasma now. We see it out the front also. Yes, plasma. Wait, wait, visor's down now. Check your suit. Okay, sure. and I'm gonna go back off. It's going pretty good now. Don, it's really neat. It's a bright orange yellow out over the nose, all around the, uh, the nose. Wow. With the temperature reaching over 1,600 degrees Celsius, the only thing between the crew and the extreme heat of re-entry are the fragile silica tiles. These tiles, they're more than just oven tiles. They're a special material that as the heat comes into the surface, it re-radiates back into space at a different wavelength. And so it's actually balancing out the heat flow. It's not just insulating them, but it's actually absorbing and then rejecting the heat during this long glide back into the atmosphere. This is amazing. It's really getting uh, really bright out there. Yeah, you definitely don't want to be outside now. If Columbia's toils had been damaged, any failure would be lethal. As Columbia roared through the atmosphere, Mission Control monitored the re-entry. Data from the shuttle began to show abnormal temperature rises inside the left wing. In less than five minutes, it climbed by more than 60 degrees. Where is that instrumentation located? In the uh, aft part of the left wing, right in front of the elevons. The internal structure of the shuttle's wings are made up of hundreds of aluminum cross members wired with thousands of heat sensors. These struts bear the load of the wing, giving it rigidity for the high stresses of launch and re-entry. If the leading edge had been damaged during launch, this could allow hot gases to blast into the wing cavity. If the leading edge of the wing was cracked near the fuselage, as I believe almost certainly was the case, uh, you had essentially a blowtorch of superheated air, actually air that was much hotter than a blowtorch, coming in, melting the underlying aluminum structure, cutting through the electrical lines th to the temperature sensors, which suddenly failed, and basically finding its way throughout the wing with the rise in temperature that was seen across the wing structure right into the uh, well where the, um, uh, where the tires are, where the landing gear is. Light Max. Go. We just lost uh, tire pressure on left outboard and left inboard both tires. We do not have any valid data at this time. Once heat enters into the shuttle wings, for example, it would begin to cause not just the possible loss of that part of the wing, but loss of the structure that was carrying, that was holding other tiles further back. And that once you begin heating through both the air blast and the heat, you could begin to have more than a single tile, but two, three, four, 10, 20 tiles start coming off. Then you're in a situation where the wing is no longer plain, is high drag. We know that the shuttle was pulling to the left. That would be a result of a slight increase in drag on the left wing relative to the right wing. And so the vehicle tends to turn. As the vehicle descended to lower altitude, rocket motors on the right rear end of the vehicle tried to correct the orientation of the shuttle. So the crew had to know that something was wrong at that point, and that's maybe 20 or 30 seconds prior to the breakup. At that point, the extra deceleration forces on the wing could crack it, bend it, and eventually break it off. I thought how you described it, Chris. Look at the chunks coming off of it. Yeah. We now know that five pieces of the orbiter broke off over California. Ooh. Ice, baby? No, it's just... Pieces of plasma. Flight director Leroy Kane was about to utter the words that would initiate the emergency procedures. GC flight. GC flight. Flight GC. Lock the doors. Copy. Columbia was lost. Nine one one. What's the location of your emergency? Uh, yes, sir. I was wondering if anybody knew what just blew up going across Nacogdoches. And... <laughs> I saw, the, I, saw, I saw the fireball. When I looked up and it was in 15 pieces. I think the space shuttle was supposed to land this morning. Well, I seen uh, a piece of metal fall out of the sky. I got a piece of it in my truck. Do you have a piece of it in your truck? Yes, ma'am, and it looks like a burner.
As the shuttle began to break up, its wreckage spread over thousands of square miles. The small town of Nacogdoches in Texas was directly in the line of fallout. Ed Klein was at home, unaware of the drama that was about to unfold. It was just before 8 o'clock in the morning, and um, we heard this kind of rumbling sound, which started off, the rumbling was, was mild, um, and then it went on for 30 to 45 seconds, and as it went on, it got stronger and louder. And then when I opened the door and got outside, I at first thought a gas well had exploded, and then it kind of faded off. The sound was moving away. And that's when I looked up into the sky uh, uh, to see if I could tell, see anything, and there was the big contrail or big uh, vapor trail up in the air. Reports began to come in that pieces of debris were literally falling out of the sky. Some of them clearly segments of the heat shield. Ruth Ann Peterson was just about to open the local bank. This place right here that we have marked is where the actual piece of the shuttle fell shortly after 8 o'clock that Saturday morning. I looked up because I saw a big, bright ball of white, I say fire, but it wasn't red, it was real brilliant white. But I also noticed there was a trail behind it, what I would call like sparklers. When the piece of the shuttle fell on the parking lot, the bank, which is directly behind me, it blew open the two glass doors that go, that is the entrance into the bank. It just blew them wide open. A massive recovery operation got underway. NASA wanted answers. The mystery to why the shuttle broke up could lie in any one of these pieces of wreckage. Whatever the findings of the Accident Investigation Board, one chilling question needs to be answered. Could anything have been done to save the crew? Well, it may be a delicate topic to consider what the crew was doing and whether or not, as people would prefer to think, they knew nothing and died instantly. But the, both on Challenger and Columbia, the evidence is very strong that in neither case was this instantaneous or merciful. With Columbia, they were much higher and much faster. And after the vehicle came apart, the cabin itself would probably still be in a single piece. The crew would be in their seats as the cabin pressure was lost. The suits would pressurize, feeding them emergency oxygen. They have their own parachutes. They have the ability to blow the hatches to get out. But they realize they have to get down below 40,000 feet before it's safe to be on a personal chute. So they'd have to sit in their seats, waiting, hang together, baby, hoping that the cabin can hold together. As the cabin got lower, because of its great speed, it was encountering much stronger crushing deceleration forces than it was ever built to withstand. And the structure, heated perhaps by the outside uh, shockwave, just couldn't have held up. It seems to have held up part of the way because the debris from the cabin and the crew appears to have been found in a relatively small area, not spread across most of East Texas like the rest of the shuttle. How close they came to riding that cabin in and jumping out, we don't know and may never know. But what we do know is that data reveals in the last few seconds the pilots may have been fighting to get the shuttle under manual control. What NASA has to do is to bridge the gap between not being able to survive on Columbia and being able to survive a similar accident, possible accident next time. Was this horrendous accident avoidable? Could NASA have investigated the possible damage to the wing more thoroughly before re-entry? They saw the debris hit the, hit the bottom of the orbiter. They commissioned a study to, in fact, look and try to determine if it was going to be a problem. It came back and said that the tiles might be damaged, but that the damage would not be life-threatening. Everything that's been made public uh, certainly makes me question uh, the optimism that was uh, used in that study. As a result of having seen what we did on the, on the film, of course, we kicked off the engineering analysis just to, uh, for completeness, just to make sure that uh, uh, we had assessed uh, what possible damage might have occurred. And uh, over the course of the next several days, the engineering analysis uh, was dispositioned that it was no safety of flight issue. Well, it's, it's a very interesting attitude, uh, given that they lost the vehicle. 
they knew that the heat shield could be damaged, and they just basically did very little. They had no contingency plans at all when they've had decades of knowledge of this potential problem. And it's very clear to me we're going to lose other shuttles if things are continue as they've been going. We're looking for exactly what caused this accident. If it turns out to be the thermal protection system, the, the shuttle tile, uh, you bet we're going to uh, we're going to do whatever it takes to uh, beef those up uh, before we return to flight. Space flight is 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 risky. Uh, it doesn't mean that we ever tolerate mistakes. Uh, I, I never call Challenger an accident. Challenger was a consequence of bad decisions. People at the time knew were bad decisions. Columbia looks a little more ambiguous. It looks like a combination of a series of things. No, no single oversight, no single event, but enough of them pile on top of the other to result to add up to catastrophe. Whether we break another one with or without losing the crew or even break two more, it may well happen. But the end of this shuttle program's flight history is pretty much clearly now in sight. We'll do as much as we can to improve the reliability of the shuttle as long as we fly it. But eventually we need to develop new space transportation. And the reliability and safety will be right at the top of the list. And hopefully not the sort of compromises we had to make with the shuttle. The question is, what is the best way to reduce the risk and make it as safe as possible for a reasonable amount of money? Um, and that's, that's a question that I think that uh, NASA has to look at very, very carefully. Ironically, NASA's design concepts for the shuttle replacement are looking more like the original version from the early 70s. A smaller, stubbier winged orbiter mounted above the launch system. having a much smaller vehicle, the heat shield problem becomes much more manageable. And that would make the vehicle enormously uh, more safe for re-entry. And at the same time, you could attach pieces, uh, other sections to, the, to this capsule-like structure that could be payload if you wanted to use, uh, lift very heavy payloads with human crews to orbit. You can always argue after an accident that more could have been done up to, you know, and including not flying. So the safest thing would have been to leave Columbia on the ground. But we all have to recognize that flying humans into space is a very risky business. If we want to continue a space program that's robust, we want to take technology that we have well in hand, that's highly reliable, that is tested, and we want to just simply shape it to the mission we have. And we can do it if we make the right choices, technically. In the end, this tragedy must lead to a launch system that matches the bravery of the humans who willingly face the dangers of space. Yeah, you definitely don't want to be outside now.